Thank you very much. And uh, first, uh, my profound gratitude to you all for having me over. Uh, in fact, I've just gone into Boston uh, to uh, Houston, Texas yesterday evening. So uh, even before I know the climate here, I have disturbing news from India. And today's newspaper carries a story about how uh, sex workers in Hyderabad are now facing a new problem with transgenders coming in. Said I think it might just be okay. an echo. Uh, transgenders becoming competitive to them and uh, government suddenly realizes there are a number of cases against transgenders uh, increasing in sex trafficking rather than uh, women. No, I don't know how to see this. Do I see this as uh, disturbing? Do I see it as good? Obviously, you don't see it as good because um, if you're replacing one evil by one genre of people with another set of people, then it's not good news. I also strongly come from the belief that uh, paid sex of any format is uh, an exhibition of exploitation and therefore needs to be Cutting. Who the victim is is a secondary issue. It could be women, it could be transgender, it could be men, depending on where from what the necessity are. Now, I also noticed that among the things uh, that are uh, milestoned in what I need to be addressing is domestic violence. And uh, as I speak to you from the office at Daya, I think. Uh, it's very important to sensitize and believe that in polities which have eco social economic challenges. Now, when I say social economic challenges, I don't mean only poverty. Poverty can be just one visible aspect of uh, the challenge. Very often, uh, our culture, our societal habits, draw very unhygienic verticals. And these verticals today create a kind of a power uh, equation between the exploiter and the exploited. Typically, even if we've seen the umpteen number of rape cases, the famous Nirbhaya rape case in India, for example, it was not economics in the sense that the victim was not somebody from a poorer economic status versus somebody who was at a higher economic status. This also happens. It's not, it's not as if this does not happen, it happens. But this was a case of people, largely, I, I, I really don't know if I should be saying, outsiders, uh, trying to believe that manhood is power and that they, exhibit their power by exploiting sexually people who they think are helpless. Now this paradigm that women are helpless, men are powerful, and women better behave properly, women better dress properly, what women should wear, how they should wear, when they should go, where they should go, how should they should go, whose permissions are all these from? These come from what I call a socioeconomic vertical. So I'm not talking about my pay packet every month. I'm talking about the larger vertical of men who believe in a rather archaic and feudal format that Women are in an inferior sex. I can only on a jocular manner add, I believe many years ago, a young boy pompously walked up to a librarian in a well-studded library and asked the lady, ma'am, where can I find the book, Man, the Superior Sex? She immediately said, fiction. So this whole theory that man is powerful will have to change. Today, unfortunately, in a number of economies, hopefully not in the city that I am talking at right now, but in a number of third world countries, especially India, Sri Lanka, Pakistan, all those countries, Southeast Asia, the belief is 
that a feudal leftover into a capitalist society creates an unaccountable and a very powerful bias in favor of one sex, as a consequence of which no amount of governance, no amount of lawmaking is going to help beyond a point. Having said this, we would also have to come to terms with social bias and social prejudice against people who take to sex work, either voluntarily or forcefully. I'm aware, and I've been aware of this in more recent times than before, that there is a lobby today in the country, in my country, that wants prostitution legalized. I'm not going into the debate, but I, for one, have very strong views on that. I strongly believe that unless there is a much greater understanding of man-woman equality, unless there is a greater rehabilitative participation by governments, uh, it's a premature question to address. Having said this, I would now also say as a consequence of this male-female difference in our society, even today in India, men celebrate when the son is born and they're unhappy when women are born. Once in a way we say we have a woman prime minister, we have this, we have that, but that's, that takes us nowhere. That literally takes us nowhere. This symbolic presentation of women empowerment in this country is a farce. I'm telling you every minute, more than 10 women are raped in India. Now, this is alarming numbers. And when we talk about these numbers from reported statistics, we are only talking about reported cases. We are not talking about rape that happens within families. We are not talking about rapes that go unreported. We are not talking about rape among uh, workers in various societal angles. We are not talking about exploitative sex at the highest to the lowest levels of workplaces. I'm not talking about that at all. For example, we saw what happened with the Me Too movement. Some people made noise, some people made the wrong noises, and then we all shut up and went back. The fact of the matter is that there is a alarming prejudice in this one offense, more against the victim than against the accused. The moment there is a case of prostitution. Instinctively, society says, oh, so that lady is a prostitute. Not remembering that when you call her a sex worker or a prostitute or whatever name you want to give her, she is the victim of crime. She's not the criminal. Our laws call her the victim. For example, when Prajwala talks about them, they only refer to them as victims, even by accident, I've not seen Sunita Krishnan talk about them as accused or anything. Governments and policemen in particular at lower levels are crooks when dealing with the victims at this level. I do not know how it happens globally, but in, in India, in most states in India, after a rescue operation happens, another form, another vertical of harassment, of suffering, of challenges begin. So to those who believe that the moment a sex worker has been rescued in a raid, her return to normal, normalcy is on, is barking up the wrong tree. It's just moving away from one exploiter to either another format of exploitation or to a extremely unsympathetic and apathy rescued system where the police, the paralegal, the uh, other hands that are supposed to assist the rehabilitation after the person is brought out is pathetic. 
I'm saying this with a great sense of responsibility. About a decade ago, a division bench of the High Court in Andhra Pradesh had appointed a four-man committee headed by me to go across the 22 states of my state. I went to all the 22 districts and exit Prajwala and one more institution in Mahbub Nagar district. The entire state did not have a proper rescue home. So we are talking about law. We are talking about empowering women. We are talking about anti-trafficking laws. And you do not have rescue homes in each city. And we all know that sex trade is one of the most booming businesses across the globe. We have women from Bangladesh, we have women from West Bengal, from the Eastern zone coming constantly into the city I live in. How do we deal with it? How is it that governments do not have proper rescue homes when the law requires them to have rescue homes? It's almost like saying, I don't have a secretariat, or I don't have a mayoral office, or I don't have a, a state archive. This probably stems from a sense of prioritization. It probably stems from the belief that after all, uh, the sex worker is not a organized sector. They are not a constituency. They are not going to garner votes for me. So why do I bother? Why do I spend money on them? In a society where we talk about welfare mechanics, where we talk about welfare mechanisms, we are talking about uh, getting free uh, gas cylinders for the poor. We are talking about midday meals at schools, but we don't have even rescue for women in destitution. Forget women who are rescued, even destitute women, or children on the wrong side of law. They are all left to fend for themselves. And how do they fend for themselves? Also, you must understand, even as I talk about this, in the last six months, if you look at Bollywood, what is the cinema we celebrate? Mangubai, Gangubai. Gangubai is the story of a lady in Bombay, who got into flesh trade, who became a very successful lady, and she started ruling the roost. Now, if we are culturally willing to celebrate prostitution, if we are culturally willing to look at women as objects, as long as society objectifies women, and we continue to do that even today, go to a film in India, what are they doing? The guy woos the woman. I know in the 60s and in the 70s, Shami Kapoor sang all those songs with Sadhana and Sharmila Tagore, but that was all right for us because in that generation, somewhere it, didn't, it did not create this kind of a challenge. But today, if Shah Rukh Khan trolls uh, Juhi Chawla in Dar, we're all, we're all sitting and enjoying it. Now, there is something, there's, some, there's a problem there. And the most serious problem that you have today is every evening from five o'clock in the evening to 11 o'clock in the night, you just have to sit in your drawing room to see the portrayal of women in their evilest form. There's this good lady and the bad lady and nine out of 10 times the bad lady is succeeding, one out of 10 times maybe the good lady does. Now this cultural milieu on the one hand, on the other hand, the empathy or the lack of it, systemic lack of empathy. Third, a complete crush of structural infrastructure requirement to save rescue people. It took Prajwala, I hope I'm not sounding like a salesperson for Prajwala, but it took Sunita Krishnan five years or 10 years to start a proper rescue operation mechanism in the state of Andhra Pradesh. 
The protocol is still dicey. Uh, the, the group that goes to rescue, the group that brings them to the uh, police station, what happens after that is another group, their sensitivities are suspect. So these are not just logistics challenges. These are fundamental challenges because these are fundamentals based on the fact that governments do not seem to press in and say, this is what we need to do. We need to understand that in a country that worships women on the one hand, Saraswati, Lakshmi, Durga, we have events, we have uh, Durga Puja, we have Lakshmi Puja, we do all this. But again, what do we do after that? Temple towns in our country are famous for sex trafficking. Our pilgrims are yearning for paid sex. This is what statistics show us. Why is it so difficult for a government that can fight terrorists, that it can't find, fight pimps? Is it so difficult? Why is it that today, 70 years after we are a democratic country, India, why is it that after umpteen international conventions globally signed by almost every civilized country, that we still have the challenge of domestic violence? Domestic violence in India looks like a Khalid Hussein novel. It looks pathetic because women get beaten up as a matter of course. Men tell their girls in marriage, please learn to tolerate. The day, I keep telling people this, the day parents start telling children, teach their daughters how to fix the bulb and teach their son how to cut tomatoes, we will start profiling properly gender sympathy in our country, but we don't do that. On the other hand, the boy can come back at two in the night, drunk like a fish. The girl can't go out after 10 p.m. Maybe parents, middle class in India, are genuinely worried because the streets in our states are no longer safe. I understand that. But my police, unfortunately, is trying to catch people up for drunken driving, not for rape. It takes much longer for the police to reach a rescue area than it would take for them to do a raid of, say, drugs at a restroom. This emanates from the understanding that let's blink when women suffer for paid sex. Are they organized? What happens to these women after they are rescued? To this date, I do not know of a proper budgeting pattern by the government that allocates money for rehabilitation of sex workers. Many years ago, 20, 30 years ago, I was a part of a study that happened in Hyderabad at a very famous red light area called Mehboob Kimeni. 30 years ago, I said, and this was accepted by the High Court, they delivered a judgment saying, rescue sand rehabilitation is a waste. All the rescued victims are going to recycle themselves with more bitterness. They know the tricks of the trade better now and they will get back because they don't have a choice. Rehabilitation is about giving them a self-respecting alternative choice. I'm of the convinced opinion. Don't ask me if I have empath empirical data. It's humanness that no woman takes to prostitution as a choice of profession. Even those who believe that it shall be legalized, if we have the patience, if they have the wherewithal to look into why they make this choice, you realize that these are not choices made voluntarily, 
the choices are me these are choices made largely because of compulsions not visible but surely social economic very often girls at a very young age when they do not even know at 40 at 15 what kind of career choices we made and it is so unfortunate that in our country the whole middle class and i'm sure a lot of them go into prostitution men are the same who are spending a lifelong earning in getting their children into the best schools and colleges to ensure that their children go to engineering or medical school or law school and what do you do we government today there was a time in our constitution when the government's duty was to ensure primary education they jolly well handed it over to the private sector so that part of your job is gone you are one of the fundamental jobs of the of a government worth its name is to ensure proper law and order in a state you tick the box when you realize or when you know that law is being is being exploited and somebody is committing crime today it may not be as big a crime as uh, banking frauds are but the trauma is much more and these are traumas that the reserve bank can't come in and change for you therefore you need to have police officers who are conscious, who are sensitive, and who understand that rescue is not the end of prostitution. It's a very feeble infant step moving towards a proper rehabilitative process. If your rescue protocol is suspect, then you are collecting, you're going fishing with a fishnet that is torn. You're going there understanding that many of the fish that you are likely to catch is going to escape the net even before you put it back in your bag. So all this drama of muskan, of smile, of central government saying we are with you, central government and state government, uh, talking about having policies, having programs. The end result of this and more is that today in my state, right before the High Court, is a judgment, is a 200 page study report which is begging for attention. It's not just sex workers, it's rescued children. It's rescued women, it's rescued uh, juveniles, children in opposition to law, all these people. Sometimes I find it strange that a 10 year old girl who was picked up from child labor on a railway platform and a hardcore prostitute who was caught up in a rescue operation are made to stay in the same room in the same home. Now, this can be disaster. What do we do? What's the solution? Will it continue to be as dampening and damning as it is? I hope not, because today, somewhere, uh, the courts, the Supreme Court of India and the Justice Lokur had a judgment on what are all the steps that governments need to take. Some governments are doing well. Gujarat, Telangana is doing much better than many other states, the state I come from. Are at least till rescue is happening are doing reasonably well. Another very serious problem, and this I'm sure uh, as a lawyer I can share with you, that after the rescue, magistrates do not follow the law. Somebody comes to the court, seeks custody before the magistrate saying, I am the father, I am the guardian. 
with hardly any study of any serious impact, the child or the victim is sent back to the person who persecuted this whole thing. The person who comes back and says, can I take custody is the person who pushed this child or this victim into prostitution. So even courts sometimes, especially the magisterial courts, need a larger sensitivity on how to deal with children and more particularly children involved in sex and sex workers as a larger community. Uh, I would believe that uh, I could pause here for some time, address questions, and later on, if there is something more that I need to say, I would, but at this point in time, probably answering some questions, some concerns will be of some use. Questions open to all of you and anybody else. So, um, I, I, I would like to know the services that you offer at uh, uh, Yes. Oh. Uh, Prajwala is an NGO. It's run by Dr. Sunita Krishna. And uh, I myself, I'm a guest with the offer, so I, I'm not, I'm, I don't represent Prajwala. I'm just a well-wisher of Prajwala. It's a spearheading organization in India that works with sex workers, rehabilitation. They also participate in rescue operations. Fortunately, Sunita Krishnan's uh, repute being what it is, she is taken very, very, very seriously by the government. So most of the things she tells them, she, they take seriously, as seriously as an NGO can ever be taken. Unfortunately, she is not funded by the government. Therefore, she is constantly under pressure. And the problem is rescued women are supposed to be in rescue homes run by the government. And since the government has no rescue homes, all of them land up at Prajwala. And as a consequence of which, she is constantly facing the challenge of managing rescued children, which is no part of her job, seriously speaking. Then there is this, you know, when you rescue, you don't know who these people are. Some of them are hardcore people who are still monitoring, are still hoping to get some more people into the profession. They come into the homes. They start creating a revolt. Some of them have run away. They've taken people away with them. This is a major challenge again they have. And of course, she does amazing rehabilitation work. Unlike the stereotypical Indian uh, rehabilitation, where we say women, ask them to stitch clothes, ask them to go as ayahs, or ask them to make pickles and sweets to eat. Uh, she's uh, defied this. They have agriculture, they have land in which she makes them grow uh, plants, food, uh, crash crops. She has a whole unit of printing press. She's taught them printing, stationery, and all that. Then, of course, there is carpentry. Amazing carpentry work is done at their center. My, the furniture in my house is what I bought from Prachwala. So I'm putting my money where my mouth is. And uh, I believe that these kind of initiatives need much greater encouragement. Uh, people who with a good conscience may have to contribute to the cause because she has no money of her own. She's properly audited. She's therefore, and she has enough enemies. So she, if she doesn't audit her papers, they'll be tapping at her doors. So I think Prajwala is a good textbook on how, if the government did half of what Prajwala was doing, I think they would, they've gone double the distance that they have so far gone. I have a question. You laid out all these challenges. Can you talk specifically about the role the caste system plays in the exploitation of the people you defend so rigorously? Well, you know, caste is a nice old horse whip that we use. Uh, I know that it does seep in, into our system. I, I won't deny its existence. And, uh, but today, urban India does not suffer caste as much as it suffers religion. 
Today, polarization is more dangerously on religious grounds. And I hate to say this, but this is happening. This is not to, I am re-emphasize, this is not to say that caste does not play a role in prostitution. It does. Don't forget, uh, we have celebrated, uh, uh, we have saying, oh, oh, the community is known for prostitution. This community, uh, we have films like Ice Thais that comes to my mind where uh, the girl is uh, brought into a ceremonial manner in which she enters sex work. So there is a certain community that is uh, said to be born for this. And then you give them all kinds of perverse logic saying this is how they are serving man, serving God, and all that kind of absolute certified thrash. And uh, the consequence is that cost, well, yes, to a very minimal extent, more because caste somewhere seeps under the carpet somewhere or the other. But I believe there are greater forces that deal with prostitution in urban India than caste. Because urban India is moving away from a very strict social class system, caste system. We still follow caste very, very strongly when it comes to uh, social behavior, social uh, interaction or marriage and things like that. But I don't ask my driver whether he belongs to a community or not. I don't ask my domestic help whether they belong to a certain community or not. So I, I think to that extent, uh, I take caste marginally away from the larger equation. I find that very hard to believe with the impressions I have of <laughs> India, very hard because I think it's so part of the fabric that it's not even thought about or bought into the consciousness of people, no, maybe. No, no let no. me tell you this. Now, let's take reported cases of rape in the country, rape. Mm -hmm. Most of them are by relatives. You find mm -hmm. a shocking number are by family members, known members relatives, incestual. Now, here caste will have to go in. Into prostitution, when man goes and pays, I don't think he's saying uh, is the victim of a community or not a community. Maybe the bias in the rural sector and the non-available, the, the socioeconomic consequences of caste forces them into prostitution. That may be true. That may be yeah. true. That I'm not denying. That I'm not denying. That will definitely be there because uh, after all, the whole economy in the rural background suffers this uh, birthmark uh, horrendously. And therefore, yes. But after a certain point when the person is into prostitution, I don't think caste will play a major role. Yeah, I'd agree with that. But the fact that it's a push factor. True. Oh, yes, it will remain. Push and it will it's remain a bedrock of the Hindu religion. True. Oh, yes. And so yes. when you bring up the fact that it's really, true. really true. a religious true. polarization. Oh, there's a question coming on. Yes, you'll have to unmute her. Oh. One minute. You're muted. She's unmuting you. I yes, she can do it herself. You can do it yourself. You'll have to unmute. There we go. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I have a question about uh, the you know, organization Hedjwala. Uh, once these victims are brought to uh, Hedjwala, I mean, how, the, how is the rehabilitation done and how long are they or are they released to their parents or whoever? So how do you make sure they are on the track of rehabilitation and uh, a new life and don't, don't go back to the old style of life? And uh, how are they, how are these victims identified? And what? Now, there are various streams. Uh, I, and I can only talk to you as much as I know about them. One stream, of course, is when they are rescued 
the law requires them only temporarily to stay at a rescue home. The law requires them to move from a rescue home to a rehab home, both of the government. Now the rescue homes, because they are absent, they use Prajwala and they use another social uh, organize uh, another government run organization, which is not a rescue home, but it doubles up as a rescue home. So once these people are produced before a magistrate, even before the home study report comes in, they are released. In such cases, Prajwala is totally helpless. They can do nothing about it. Though today, I think Prajwala is totally building up a legal team that would also go to a court and oppose these uh, children going back to the source from where they were brought in, namely their parent or whoever styles themselves as the parent. This is one. The other stream, of course, is to have them into one of their training programs. And while these people are being trained, I think they're also being counseled into the belief that prostitution is not the only alternative for you. There are far more respectable alternatives available to you, such as these works that you are now getting trained to doing. So this time when you go out into mainstream society, please, you have a choice. So don't choose prostitution, choose uh, carpentry, choose uh, publication, choose agriculture, choose so many things. They also, I have seen, have many of these girls settled into matrimony. Uh, I remember I was party to a kanyadan that I did to one of the girls at a marriage. She manages to do something like this once, uh, occasionally once in a year, once in two years, I don't know how often. I've been there twice till now. She collects a little bit of a trousseau, a few things for them to start a small family gets uh, somebody of a lower economic group who's willing, who knows the past of this girl and is willing to marry her. And uh, so life begins. Um, I also have a question. So is uh, Prejwala only open to women or is it open to men as well? Because I think that's a huge, hugely like underrepresented population if you look statistically. Absolutely. I, 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 uh, the Prashwala is only open for women. It's not even open for transgender. So there... forget men. And uh, I'm not very sure. I'm not even sure if we have 10 cases of uh, men complaining of, uh, of a raid being happening and men being rescued, not to my knowledge. Mm -hmm. So uh, that almost to me looks like a first world problem. It's very prevalent. Very, 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 could be, uh, surely prevalent, surely prevalent, surely prevalent. Yes. Uh, again, uh, are these uh, perpetrators identified and are, are they punishable by Indian uh, law? Yes, they are punishable by law. Why not? They are punishable by law. That is why we have an immoral trafficking abolition act. Mm -hmm. uh, very strangely, you know, at one point in time, we called it the CETA, S-I-T-A, Suppression mm -hmm. of Immoral Trafficking Act. And it didn't suit our religious. Yes, no, no. <laughs> Therefore, we call it Immoral Trafficking Act. Uh, 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 yeah. uh, prohibition Act. So mm -hmm. we have a prohibition act. And very strangely, I know of judgments of the court where the man who indulges in prostitution was scot free because there was no sentence against him. This is a law at that point of time only made pimping the landlord, etc., etc., as the accused. Now the laws changed, changed about okay. six months ago, one year ago, where even um, trolling, uh, stalking a person is now added to the crime. And it's very disheartening to know that these children uh, go back, but they are released, you know. Here, if you see in the child abuse cases, they are, you know, they are, they are taken away from the parents, abusive parents, and then given, they are placed in a foster home, and then whatever is done. So there is an accountability. So if the children are released, and they will go back to the same style of life, because there is money involved, there's a lot of money in doing this profession, then going to carpentry work and other things. 
Let me share with you my own experience when I was on this study group. I go to a home and I pull out their register. They show me that girl A was brought to this home and uh, in one of the districts. And somebody goes before the magistrate and says, I am the guardian and the father. And they take this girl. And then address is given. The phone number is given. When I call up that number saying I want to talk to this girl, the girl is not there. She's obviously gone back. And there's a perceptible you can make out, you know, with uh, so many years at the bar, I know when somebody is lying, when they say she's just not around or she's doing something or she's gone to her uncle's house or she's gone here, you know, they're lying. You know, for a fact, they've gone back into prostitution. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They've gone back to prostitution. So is there any hopes of having sort of this accountability program after, you know, women are going to Prajwala and... You know, for example, as Vijay mentioned as well, like here, once they leave shelters, there are still programs that they can enroll themselves into to keep them on track. Are those available? As I said, they aren't enough. They aren't enough. But they're, they're very, very feeble if there are very, very, very feeble. And they so largely, so profoundly depend upon either NGOs or people with goodwill or uh, people who are willing to take it up at a personal level. But institutionally, on a scale of one to 10, I don't even think 1% is, one on 10 is being done. No. For example, I think you drew this good parallel between children, for example, and even Vijay spoke about children who are being abused by parents. Now, uh, when children are given an in inter-country adoption or even a national adoption, every six months, a magistrate is required to take a home study report of the child's progress in whichever place they are in. I, I think it's elementary, Watson. Why can't we do the same thing with people who are rescued from prostitution? We need to do that, but we don't do that. But yes, Vichy, I think you've drawn up a nice question and... Uh, this is one thing I could suggest when I go back to the courts and when the matter comes up, I will keep this in mind okay. about some format of monitoring uh, people who have been rescued and sent back. The one takeaway for me definitely from this meeting. And are there any government funds, referral funds, grants, anything available? Uh, I'm sure nothing. Uh, I think uh, annually uh, Sunita Krishnan goes with a begging ball around the world. Mm. And good wishes, well wishes. Mm -hmm. That's about all. Yeah, so this is even good. It, yeah. In a way is good in the sense mm -hmm. what could also happen with governmental funding is you know mm -hmm. uh, the other day I was appointed as a amicus for the court in a case mm -hmm. where the court got a story about how pathetically the government school for the blind is running in our state. Mm. So I was sitting in the court hall and the chief justice said, Ravi Chandra, give up all your work first, go and see what's happening there. Go there and give them a surprise check. And I go to this blind school to find that the children have to go about half a kilometer to go to the toilet. Mm. The warden of the boys hostel is a staff nurse who's not a warden, but is an additional charge of this. And she stays 20 kilometers away from the place of work. So it's sometimes a blessing in disguise not to have government aid. And for NGOs to they find it difficult, but it's better they run it themselves because governments have a tendency to play big brother, Mm -hmm. They do not bring in the empathy. They don't bring in the same passion. Uh, they don't. Uh, they don't really have the wherewithal to translate the letter of the law because the passion is missing. 
and all the money that the government has would be justification enough for the government to say, oh, we've done what we want to, and the money won't reach the, yeah. the victims. So in India, I, you know, I'm from Bangladesh, and I was a professor back home in law department, and I used to do a lot of consultancy on gender rights, incorporate, incorporating the gender rights into uh, NGOs, uh, services, and the government of it, uh, offices and all. So I have seen a lot of uh, funding coming from UN, like, uh, uh, you know, from abroad. And uh, so then, don't you get them? I'm sure she gets funding. I'm sure she gets funding. I'm sure any NGO gets funding. Mm -hmm. But today, again, even funding in India is now a new challenge. NGOs funding in India is again another. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't want to go there. I, I yeah, want to, yeah. I don't well, want, have, I want to yeah, keep on yeah. the way. The nonprofit non status, right? You have to keep on yeah. applying for that. Every Today, yeah. uh, even people like Miss Settlewad is facing problems. Uh -huh. You know, they yeah. swoop in, they'll say FEMA, they'll say FERA. If one day you've said one sentence against the government, 10 of the khaki men will be at your doorstep. But funding, yes, happens. Funding happens based on what you've done. Depends on the audit at the end of the funding institution. United Nations is a great example. I'm sure there are more, uh, not just the United Nations, there are a lot of institutions across the world. There's so many organizations outside of the recognized United Nations uh, siblings where uh, the international organizations which would like to support a cause like this. Like there are people who support causes for education, people support causes for thalassemia in the country today. Now thalassemia funding is becoming a big thing. Temple funding is becoming very popular in my country. So maybe something like that, there are organizations and uh, I'm sure they would, uh, those are the kind, you know, you also, you know, once you're in the field, you start looking out, you know, who the kind of people who are likely to fund, which are the kind of organizations that can empathize with you and give you money. I have spoken to a few people in, in the United States. Uh, I know of one Ms. Rebati uh, from uh, San Jose, who's given a good uh, amount to Sunita Krishna. So it happens. We also, you know, very, very little, very, very little. We add a teaspoon of uh, water to the bucket sometimes. Is Prajula a 501c3 nonprofit under the Indian uh, uh, laws? Come again? Is it a five, here is a 501c3, it's a charitable uh, status. So Prajula is, uh, is, is a charitable institution? I have not examined it. I've not okay, yeah, because if you want to make a donation, then no. And I'm sure, yes, I'm sure she has an ATG exemption. I'm okay. sure she has an ATG exemption. See, you know, we have a foundation. We have a trust. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. Video. I'll, I'll put Sunita Thank across you. to you and tell her Thank that. Thank you. Said. Yeah, so if you have to, if you, are, if you want to send the money to, you know, it has to be sent only to a non-profit, yes. Yes. You know, which is registered. That's what you I know, when somebody you. from the U.S. asks me, Ravi, do you know an organization that needs some assistance. I always name Prajwala because you know what happens. Mm -hmm. uh, other branches like education yeah. is quite yeah. popular. Uh -huh. Enough people giving money for those mm -hmm. kind of people. It is mm -hmm. these people who badly need it. Yes, I know. Yeah. Very badly need it. Has there ever been a partnership with local temples, gurdwaras and stuff because they do receive so many donations. However, I don't believe that they need crores of you know rupees per annum to run the temple? Has that ever? Well, we believe, you know, in India, they say Ma Manava Seva is Madhava Seva. The yeah. Service to man is service to God. But then to us, service to God is lip service and therefore service to man is vocal. I hope we put our money where our mouth is, but we don't. So what exactly? I mean, you're an attorney. What? What is? How is your uh, relation with the with the Pajala? Oh, I I do all their cases, and if I may add, free of cost. I don't bill them. Yeah, yeah, pro bono. Yes, yeah, so we, we really yeah, appreciate pro bono because uh, yeah, yeah. I completely empathize with what she's doing. Mm -hmm. I have great respect for her, so we do all her work for her. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, as an attorney, I. 
over the period of time have some kind of uh, repute with courts. So when I stand up and tell a court something on matters of this kind, I'm taken far more seriously. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, lawyers of this level normally don't fight these kind of causes. They are fighting taxi meter cases. So the judges know that this is a different ball game. So that comes to them as an advantage. And to me, it's some kind of a soul cleansing. Oh, too little, too little, too little, too little. Can you talk about one uh, of the case that really touched your heart and it did a lot of, they, I mean, it really brought, you know, brought a good outcome? Um, oh, oh, you know, typically what happens in these cases? I know this girl who father was the man who pushed her into prostitution. And uh, he comes back after she's rescued. And uh, she says, I want to go back. And uh, we've heard her story. It's pathetic. And she says, no, my father's a very good man. All these are lies. She comes to court and tells the court that this is, uh, my father's a good man, etc., etc. Lo and behold, I was there and the judge knew that, oh, this is Ravi Chandra, so let's take him seriously. And I told the judge, please don't go by what the papers are saying. There's more to it than needs that. Call this case after three months and let's see what happens. So during this three month period, obviously she was counseled. And uh, after three months, when the court called her back, we by then also had a complete report on the father, what he does, what is his economic status, how does he live, he has no other money but this girl. So then the court put two and two together and said, we are not releasing this girl to the father. Okay. And okay. then what happened after about six months or nine months, when that connect between the father and the daughter was gone, after nine months, when she was asked, do you want to go back to him? She said, no way, I don't want to go back to him. So there's, there's also a challenge to ensure that, you know, that whistle on this cooker is taken off. They don't have that much of pressure on them. They understand, they realize that this talk about, you know, you can live on your own, that you don't have to live out of fear from your father or from the pimp or from the local gunda. That assurance is also not forthcoming in a big way in our country. And that is why they, they sleep with the enemy. They rather make friends with the guy who today may beat her up, but at least tomorrow will take her to the hospital because he has to earn out of her. So sometimes it is that part of the cycle that needs to be broken. I mean, I remember reading uh, Nicholas Pistol's uh, Harper's Tide where he really spoke about different cases. I mean, actually, I also did an expert opinion on one of the trafficked, a woman who was trafficked, raped, and uh, she somehow made to America, and uh, an attorney was, um, you know, uh, helping her with the case. And I was one of the, I was the expert, actually, to show with all the studies how difficult or challenging it will be for her to go back mm -hmm. to, to Punjab. And, <clears throat> and now she's here. She's, she's in California and she's doing well. Um, but it was like the studies, is, if you look at the studies, it's so horrible for how yes. the system is like taken and, um, you know, they don't have any, any, any status. And it's really, I guess, you know, also nauseating is that oftentimes, like, you know, there will be one token case, which is really publicized. And they're saying that, you know, like Nirvaya, for example, she wasn't from like very high socioeconomic class, nor was she from a very low socioeconomic class. But using that case to justify that, like, we are doing something about this, when in fact, like, I wrote a research paper about this, is that did that case really help the country? Or did it like, was it disgraceful to all of those who don't get that public, like publicization? They don't get that 
level of assistance from the country. So, I mean, it's a double-edged sword. <laughs> Who is recording this program? Because, I am. Yeah. Yeah. So I think we should be done. Yeah. Thank you so much. And okay. Anytime I, I leave my card with you and uh, anytime any issue to do with this, anytime feel free. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. It's nice meeting you. Thank you. Thank you so much.